The theme of the today's conference is crucial. And to discuss about the key challenges board members are facing today and will face tomorrow, we have the privilege of having a panel of distinguished guest speakers who will be introduced to you in a few minutes. But to give the formal kickoff of this conference, may I invite to come on stage Valérie Moratti. Ah, oh, please, Valérie. Valérie, Valérie is, a, is a dean at uh, faculty at ESCP, uh, doyen des professeurs, and uh, Valérie uh, will say some welcome words. Uh, Franck Bournois, who is the global dean and CEO of the school, couldn't unfortunately be with us today, and he apologizes. Valérie, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, welcome, everyone. Good evening. So I'm very honored and happy to introduce such an exceptional conference at ESCP, and I thank my dear colleague for organizing it. I'm particularly happy, at least for three reasons. So first of all, I won't go uh, into details because you will know much more after the conference, but definitely today more than ever, corporate governance is at the heart of strategic decision it's a major topic of interest for everyone who want to work in business. It's a key pillar in ESG. And well, we as a business school have to play a major role on that. So second, the, the topic is, as well as the panel fully reflects ESCP values and the ESCP values or, I mean, take the letters, the first letters of ESCP, values of excellence, sustainability, community, and progress and innovation, as well as ESCP strategy. Actually, sustainable transition is the very first pillar of our 22-25 strategic plan, including environment, social, and governance challenges. I'm sure you will hear about that Tonight, our goal is to inspire and educate purposeful, driven leaders of tomorrow. And of course, corporate governance is part of it. So I would like, and also we are not only educating people, but we are developing uh, knowledge and doing research on that topic. I know there were some workshops organized earlier today and yesterday on the topic. I'm sure this will nurture our future, future research. And I want to partly particularly thank, sorry, uh, my dear colleague, Professor J David Shekroun, as well as Drew Chagrin, who were very active in that, as well, of course, uh, as our partner, KPNG, <laughs> and uh, all the, the, the people from KPNG working with us. Last but not least, the speakers are all not only internationally renowned, but also partners or sometimes even friends of the school and the ESCP community. So just to name a few, uh, Lord David Gold, he's the president, the, the chairman of our London campus, for example. And Geles is teaching in some uh, courses at, uh, at ESCP. So, but uh, I, they, they will all be introduced. At the end of the conference, you will have the pleasure to have uh, just a snapshot of uh, the innovation we are, not myself, but colleagues, and specifically David and Drew, I mentioned earlier on, have developed in terms of pedagogy through a boardroom simulation. Thank you all and enjoy the conference. Thanks very much, Valerie, for your introduction. As I mentioned before, the Professorship in International Corporate Governance was sponsored by KPMG. So I have the pleasure to call on stage Wilfried Loriano Dorigo, 
Wilfried is one of the senior partners of KPMG. He's chairing the supervisory board of KPMG France. He is also the coordinator for the Conseil Présidentiel pour l'Afrique, the Presidential Council for African Affairs, which reports to President Macron cabinets. And besides, Wilfried is an ESCP alumnum. Wilfried, please. Merci, merci, Patrick. Um, I've been asked to, 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 to speak in English, and I will try to do so. Um, dear participants and distinguished speakers, uh, I'm very pleased and uh, particularly honored to introduce this conference on corporate governance today. The historical and continuous partnership between the two prestigious institutions, KPMG and ESCP, both are more than a century, was based on a common goal to promote research on in economics and social issues reachable to all students in order to raise the awareness on global issues. Recently, the following specific, specific action were covered. First, the professorship on corporate governance from 2016 to 2000, 2019 under the leadership of Patrick Hubert Petit, uh, and I want to thank Patrick for all his leadership on that. And the second action KPMG has been doing at ESCP is really to, to sponsor the professorship for this new gen uh, um, management in, uh, at, at this school. So basically, these are the two action, recent actions uh, KPMG have been doing to sponsor all the, uh, this activity with the school. And I must say, I must say that before that, uh, Patrick has been doing this spo leadership sponsoring with the school for years. And, and, and uh, it is also important to highlight that the common area of concern uh, uh, as audit firm for us is it is important to have governance. Governance is absolutely key. Why governance is key? Governance is key because before we need to set the boundaries, we need to set the objective, and any companies need to have this objective, and the board are there to set these boundaries, which is important. Now, uh, I want really to emphasize that what are the key topics for the board agenda nowadays. The first thing I think which is important to highlight is the fact that uh, it is important to set the boundaries, it is important to set the objective. Uh, the KPMG, uh, uh, as a board member, uh, basically what we have been doing, what is important for us as a board member? As a board member, I think it is important to first design the framework in which the company uh, leadership need to be working. And secondly, I think it is important to, 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 to control. And for this, in my view, uh, I may be saying that very more, more quickly, I see that the key topics that need to be addressed are ESG. ESG is really important. And, and um, why is this important? Because it is transforming all the businesses. Digital transformation is already very key. And, uh, and uh, uh, talent acquisition is extremely key as well. And, and we, as a board, need to set the tone. And it is not al always <coughs> obvious to set this tone. And, and, and it is. It needs courage for the board 
to set the stone and to make sure that they have the correct measurement, you know, to, 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 to follow that. So that, that's really broadly what I want to say, and uh, and uh, very, very very sorry if I've been long, but I want I don't want to to finish this without uh, really uh, saying a very uh, a very big thanks to 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 David uh, for the for the uh, for the uh, leadership in this partnership with KPMG for years, and I want. Uh, also finish without thanking uh, Patrick Hubert Petit, who has been a mentor, who has been uh, 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 a leader, who has really established this relationship with, between KPMG and, and uh, ESCP. I'm also an alumni of, uh, of the ESCP. I'm, I'm the partner of KPMG. And as a global leader, what is important for the board uh, it is important for me, and, and we need to really raise this awareness of board issue at every <coughs> level, and for the students, uh, not only for, for, for those in activity, but also for the students. So that's the few words I want to say, and I'm very pleased that KPMG was able to sponsor this initiative for years, and I hope that will continue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Winifred, for your friendly words and inspiring speech. And now I leave it up to David to, to, have, to deliver some keywords, notes. <coughs> Thank you enormously, Patrick, for your support and to KPMG uh, professorship. Thank you for your contribution to ESCP and to your friendship. What happens in a corporate boardrooms nearly always stay in the boardroom. You, board members, may like it. We, the public, may not like it. But this is the way boards work. And when I say the board members as opposed to we, the public, I know that I have been very caricatural and very unfair, but we are on something, and this something depicts a reality. The stakeholders, shareholders sometimes, but not always, but the other stakeholders, the public, the student, the society, and let's say the planet, are asking you, corporate board members, to take actions through your decisions and resolutions. And you just need to show up in our classrooms to identify that all students want a true corporate citizenship. Sustain sustainable project initiatives to eliminate waste, environmental and human rights clubs to achieve SDGs, sustainable development goals, it is also what we have reviewed together in the different workshops on corporate governance and human rights. So corporate governance, corporate citizenship, sorry, what does that mean? That means, long story short, that business-like organizations have social, cultural, and environmental responsibilities to the communities in which they operate, as well as financial once to the shareholders and to the economic community. In 2015, in our inaugural conference, we addressed this tension between finance and the other stakeholders, social environmental responsibilities. And we put forward some propositions in the field of law, tax, and business. And I take the opportunity to thank the friends that we are with us, the students, that contributes to the activities of the professorship. In 2022, in addition to this tension between finance and social, economic, and environmental responsibilities that I've just described, there are other uh, circumstances, extraordinary circumstances 
that we have to address pre, post, and not fully, not a pre COVID crisis. I know that. Uh, rapid society's changes, new environmental, social, and governance considerations, cybersecurity threats, and of course, geopolitical issues and risk. And a big thank you for the organizing, the moderators of the Corporate Governance Forum that took place today. And BICO and the team of the British Institute for International and Comparative Law that almost swam across the channel from England to France to join us today. So how are company boards adapting? This is the aim of our today's conference, the closing conference of the KPG Professorship in International Corporate Governance entitled Challenges for Corporate Boards in 2022. And to address these challenges, we have an impressive panel of speakers from the legal, business, and financial and environmental world from Europe, if you accept, David, that England is part of the Europe from both sides of the Atlantic and beyond. It is our great pleasure to welcome Serge Weinberg to deliver the keynote speech. Serge Weinberg is the board chairman of Sanofi and the chairman of the investment firm Weinberg Capital Partners. He's also an independent director of caring. Through his career as a civil servant, chief of staff of the Ministry of Economy, CEO, board member, chairman of strategy nomination and CSR committees, as well as chairman of the board, Serge Weinberg has accumulated four decades of experience in the political, economic, and business policy. In other words, Serge encapsulates the tradition, some would say the best tradition, of French capitalism. And Serge has accepted to deliver the mission impossible in 13 minutes to address the challenges of corporate board members in 22 from an historical, diplomatic, politic, economic, and business perspective. Not only. Not only. <laughs> Bonne chance, if you excuse my French. So without any further ado, I leave the floor to Serge. Thank you very much for uh, first having invited me for this uh, speech and this exchange. I'm very glad to have this opportunity to uh, discuss the subject with you. Um, I've been spending about 32 years in public companies. I, I know I look much younger, but uh, basically uh, this has been all my business life, uh, being a board member since 1990. And uh, then I was a CEO, board member, chairman of the board, uh, CEO, chairman. Well, I've got it all to a certain extent in four different companies of the CAC 40. Um, and I'm yet an independent uh, member at uh, Sanofi still. I've been chairman for 13 years and I'm leaving the seat next year. And uh, I'm, I'm still an independent bo a board member. I'm recently an independent board member of Caring. But basically, what is striking when you look at the uh, evolution of the uh, board memberships, uh, it's, we've been moving in the last 20 years, not before. Before, it was rather stagnant, uh, from a very passive way of behaving, you know, sort of uh, intertwined relationship. Uh, no one speaking a, a bit loud, uh, no crisis, not a lot of boardroom crisis, uh, but it started, I would say, probably in the 90s that uh, there, the question mark about governance started to be an issue. I could probably uh, link that to the Vivendi uh, story, which has started uh, probably a, a more accurate vision about what the board responsibility is about because as you remember in that company that well that went to deep trouble 
the board didn't act. And uh, that was the start of uh, uh, some question marks about the role of uh, board members. Then you had the code, and I'm not going to go through this, I'm not a law specialist, although I was part of the uh, Bouton report uh, membership, and I'm still at the board of AFEP Medef, which is uh, uh, the, the, the board that uh, encapsulates the uh, regulation about corporate governance. So that's the sort of legal framework. You have the law, you have uh, the codes, Cadbury in the UK, AFEP Medef in France, so I'm not going to look through that. But what I can say is that I've been walk, walking through a uh, journey which has started in very soft, moderate, not very explicit relationship to now uh, an experience of much harder relationships, much tougher relationships between boards and CEO. Uh, you've seen a lot of uh, companies where CEOs have uh, been departing because of tensions with the board. Uh, that happened already uh, today yeah. uh, with, uh, at Atos. And this is an example of uh, the fact that the balance between CEO and chairmanship or the balance between CEO and board has tremendously changed in the last years. We are not there yet today in many boards. Many boards are still under the pressure of their CEOs and the balance and the check and balance that should exist in boards is not always there. You've been uh, watching the Renault story. Uh, clearly the Renault story, I'm not talking about the details of the Gulen situation, but clearly there was a lack of supervision by the board on many aspects. So what does that mean? There is a, a very strong expectation now uh, from the board's behaviors. And the list, the catalog of expectations has, has tremendously ex ex expanded. So you have the, what the, I would say the, not the fashion, but what we're talking a lot about is the uh, CSR, ESG, which has become the motto, uh, the most vocal, visible motto. But to my view, this is not what is the most important. Uh, it's important to integrate those preoccupations, especially the environment, uh, into the overall work. It's not a separate chapter. You know, for a long period of time, you had annual reports with a chapter on ESG that started like this, by the way, uh, in the legal framework. You only had to have a chapter on ESG. Then you could do all the bad things that you wanted and just have the alibi of having a report on uh, ESG. Now, the investors, the boards are much more demanding about uh, what we expect from the company. It's a totally integrated vision about the environment effect from A to Z. It's really having not a separate set of accounts on you know, what is the non-financial accounting and the financial accounting. We are, going, we are moving towards an integrated report. It's not easy. It's, of course, very demanding because you have a different set of rules in different countries and we have no unified set of rules. But this is the way the world is going to go and we have to move in that direction. It's not an easy task because you have, as you know, probably different scopes, the internal scope, the immediately external, and the global external scope three, which encompasses all the impact of what the company is doing and the, uh, from the suppliers to the end consumers, the consequences of the activity of the group. But what is key to me is really uh, a number of strategic things. First, it's the board, you know, the board isn't, bo isn't born one day. A board is a, a team of people that have been elected at different times and that have, according to their knowledge of the company, to define uh, the company and its environment, to define what is the best strategy for the company. And that's not so easy. You know, you, you have a lot of area where you need a lot of work, a lot of external advice to really tailor the strategy of the company. 
And that's not just by reading an annual report that you get an idea. It's really about having spent some time at the board, knowing who the uh, XCOM members are, having discussed with them, eventually having visited sites, having uh, read a lot about the competition, the benchmarks. Benchmarking is absolutely key. Many companies do not do benchmarks. You know, they, the, CEO, the CEOs like to present themselves under the best way. And uh, of course, as you start to have benchmarks, you might have a different vision about the uh, company's experience or profitability or whatever uh, success. So this work, this hard work, uh, really is, is the base of defining a strategy. Then you have to select who is the CEO who is best fitted to apply the strategy. Sometimes he's already there, but then you have to build a strategy with him. But it's not just listening to what he says. It's really building, it's a common work. It's building strategy with the CEO and asking, you know, kicking in the tires to see if they're inflated or is it resistant to uh, all sorts of questions, whether the uh, geopolitical risks, the evolution of demand, the transforming mo mo uh, business models that you can face because you see at low volumes alternative business models that appear and that might threaten your key business. So you have to be aware of a lot of things. And most companies, and especially the big companies, tend not to be uh, uh, listening to those very weak signals. They most, most of the time, they're arrogant. They uh, despise or just ignore uh, the small signals that appear here and there. Sometimes we are wrong in inflating those signals and making them big signals. But sometimes we are right. And uh, it's the, the challenge of the board is really to present that and to discuss that with the CEO at the end of the day, to have a kick solid strategy base. And then I would say that the selection of the CEO is the most important thing. You can have, you can be on a very difficult market. If you have a good CEO, you'll be able to turn the company around, maybe change the portfolio make an evolution, but even if you're on a good market, a uh, mediocre CEO will not make it. It's very hard to be a CEO today, very hard, because you've got all sorts of pressure. Let's take the example of the actual situation we're in. You have the war in Europe, China that's changing its model quite deeply before the COVID, and the COVID has amplified uh, the uh, restriction on China and the self-inward-looking uh, policy of China and the lockdown of many businesses from foreign companies in, in China. What does that question raise? Are we able to keep on having a sustainable business in China? If we want to, how can we tailor it in such a way that at the end of the day, if the pursuit of the uh, um, closure of the Chinese economy persists. Are we ready to lose our business in China without being herded? That's the question mark that we have to be asking ourselves. Change of uh, economic environment. A lot of people that have started to work in the last 15 years ignored that there were risks of inflation. They discover inflation. What does that mean? You know, I started my profession, my business life as a, uh, a, the GM of a small company uh, when the rates were at 16%. Of course, uh, an inflation of 2 to 3% is not very frightening when you've gone through that. But that raises major question marks on the models because everyone thinks, was thinking that we were in a long period of globalization with low interest rates, with money costing nothing. Now suddenly, money costs, but that's quite normal. You know, we were in a totally insane situation where you had to pay banks for them to accept that they kept you money, which is totally absurd. But, you know, it was nice because it helped business a lot. It inflated values. It created artificial wealth, but it's over. How do we do? What does it mean? You see a lot of people not knowing what the inflation means for them. They ask, what does it mean? You know, it's good or bad? 
So it, it really requires a big change. You, know, you don't have annual catalogs to make now. You have to change your prices almost every month if you, if you are under pressure. Your pay raises are not anymore an annual discussion. It's going to be a, a split discussion along the year because the pressure is going to be tough. We have a huge societal challenge, which is finding people. In all companies, we have a major crisis of recruitment. And of course, we have uh, all the uh, specific ideas, specific subjects on, on every body's subject, uh, the business models. You know, I know pretty well the pharma, but uh, you know, whatever the businesses are, they're under threat because digitalization, because the agility of small players that we don't have when you have a legacy to manage, when you have a lot of people that have been living in a different world. So the process of change becomes very, very important. And the agents of change becomes, becomes critical in the company. So you shift, you have to shift, you have to be very agile and you have to promote this agility. That is not a work about four times in a year for four hours. It's not, it's, it's ended. That's why I'm a very strong advocate of the uh, separation between chairman and CEO. Because the CEO role, as I said, is immense, very critical. And the management of chair today is very difficult because you have a lot of suggest, subjects to comply with. Some are a little bit artificial, you know, we are for instance, Sanofi is public in the, U in the United States. We have the Tsar and Soxley uh, regulation that we have to uh, respect. This is pretty heavy in terms of bureaucracy. Uh, I would say corporate bureaucracy. You have all sorts. CSR is a full topic now in, in the boards. And the agenda of boards has become so huge that you need eight to 10 boards per year, plus strategic seminars. So it's, it's, it's impossible for a CEO to be together, in my view, to be a good chairman and to be a good CEO. And I'm a, I'm a, then I'm a, a very strong advocate of that separation. So how do we, can we deal with that in the boards? I would say we need competences. We need different competences. A board is a team. You must have diversity. You must have, of course, financial skills, but you have management. You need to have management skills. You need to have geographic skills. For instance, in a company like uh, Sanofi, we have uh, a U.S. citizen which know, who knows very well the uh, payers' environment. The U.S. is our first country. We have a Chinese who was in the tech, in the health tech. Uh, China is a second market. We have a very scientific dimension, so we have three board members who are scientifics. They are, they are scientists, they are top-notch scientists. So you have to find the balance of talents that make a real board able to, to discuss with this, the management and to really challenge the management. Because the role of a board is really to perceive because, before it becomes obvious if you're derailing. You know, it's too late. When the results are bad and everyone knows that there is something wrong, it's too late. You can't, you have missed something as a board. So it's, sometimes it's hard to understand because you see moves that no one can explain. The people outside the board, as we said, they don't understand what happens. But you had the reasons to do that move. And you can not always explain everything to the public because you don't want to expose the company to external criticism that is not its best interest. But you have to make decisions. You have to have the courage to make decisions or to stand up against certain decisions or certain way or certain behaviors, not waiting for the subject being becoming public. And that's a major thing. I think the uh, Work and courage, in my view, are the most demanding qualities that we have has for board members today. It's not, you know, competence is a, is a given. You have a lot of very competent people. You have a lot of very intelligent people. 
But what we try to build in the board, I think, is people that are brave enough, that are first, of course, intellectually uh, competent, but also that are brave enough to make their points, that are not afraid of quitting the board if they, dis they, they dissent. You know, having a board position is about money sometimes. You have people that, are, that claim that they are independent. They have five boards. Overall, it's a nice package. Where is the independence when you know that 20% of your annual revenue is going to miss if you're not nice with the CEO? That's a true question. It's even more true in the US because, of course, if you compare the uh, packages given to the board members in the US and what we give in Europe, uh, especially in France, uh, we, we have much more reason to be independent in France because uh, we are not linked with golden shades most of the time. Uh, in the US, uh, you know, typical package is a $1 million package for N plus stock options plus variable, forbidden in France. You, do, you can't have that. Your independence in link is linked to the fact that you have no vested interest into the stock evolution. So you can, you're totally independent. But despite that, you have to raise the question, is this board member strong enough to fight if there is time to fight? I went through different crises. I had a crisis at Accor with the uh, two funds that took over the company and that decided to split the company in two. I decided to leave with the, almost half of the board. And uh, some re remember that period. I'm sure that had we kept the company together, I think the company would be much stronger today. But that's another question. Uh, we had to fire, at Sanofi, we had to fire the CEO, uh, very respected CEO for the, stock, the stockholders, uh, was considered as uh, the reference. But uh, when you looked inside the company and the performances, it was not at the standard we expected. So it was surprised because, of course, nothing was visible from the outside, but we knew and we had to act. So that's what we need to do. We need, we need to have boards that are compliant from that perspective. And, uh, you know, there is no code to define what courage is. No legal definition. But that's the core, in my view, of the experience that I've led or went through in the 32 years. So thank you. <laughs>uh, chairman of the IFA, CEO of Salesforce of uh, South Europe, Angeles Garcia Podeva, who is the independent chairwoman of the Board of Directors of Legrand, Lord David Gold, lawyer and also partner of the name firm called uh, David Gold and Associates, Monica De Virgilis, chairwoman of the Board of Directors of SNAM and board, board chair of Chapter Zero in France, and of course Serge Denis. You encapsulate everything. You're the chairman of IFA. And my question is, what Serge was presenting is a kind of model, global model. But does it exist a European model? You have worked in different places. So could you tell us a bit more about whether a corporate governance model exists as opposed to the Chinese and the American, and how we could accelerate uh, um, change and sustainable growth? Well, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm talking here with the hat of the chairman of the French Institute of Directors, which is called IFA, and we gather over 3,000 board members and chairmen and chairwomen, and we try to think about governance in today and the years to come. 
Um, so yes, first of all, uh, let's define what governance is, as uh, Serge rightly pointed it. It's a set of laws, regulation, behavior, that are here to help make a better decision. So as we talk about laws and behavior, we see that it is linked to people, as Serge rightly pointed out, and therefore to the culture. <coughs> so the question is, is there one set of governance or are there different sets of governance that exist in the world? We at uh, IFA believe that there are different sets of governance because governance depends on the culture of the country that the company is mostly based in. It depends on the way you make a decision, which is based on education, and it's, ba and it's based as well governance on who you serve. Let's look at some examples. If you look at the US, for example, for those people that lived in the US, it's a very individualistic <coughs> country because it was created by pioneers they went there and they created the country they wanted for them. Second thing, as those pioneers came, they had different histories, and what took, put the country together was the legal system. Therefore, governance is based on compliance. And the last element is that because it's a free economy, governance is here to serve the interests of people that own that entity. So here we have a structure which is for individualism, compliance, for example, for shareholders. It's a very, very efficient model. However, what the drawback is that it legalizes all interaction. Let's look at the other side of the world, China. The history of China is not individualism, it's more Confucianism. The way that people make decisions is more to obey what is asked them to do. And all this is based, uh, the interest is to serve a group of individual, a clan. And this is how the system works. And a company like Huawei, for example, was very successful. And it did finance a part of the Communist Party. And that's okay over there. If you look at Europe, Europe was created after many wars. However, it developed a lot of different cultures. And we live in Europe because the other exists. It is what is defined by Emmanuel Meunier in the 30s with personalism. I exist because you exist. My wife happens to be Belgium. So I ask her, you know, define to me what a Belgian citizen is. And she tells me, well, we're not French. I say, okay, define to me what Belgium is. Well, we're not Dutch as well. And we're not German. I say, okay, say, tell me what a Belgium is. We have a king. And so, you know, I always tease on that, but Belgium was created compared to other countries, right? And they define themselves around an individual a way of behaving, and that's okay. So in Europe, we believe that we exist next to the other, which is not Confucianism, and it's not individualism. The way we make decisions is that we discuss in a set of laws. We expect a country or, uh, or Europe to make some laws, and within those laws we're going to discuss. And who is that for? It has for stakeholders. We use the word stakeholders, you know, we've used them in the coming for, in for the last five to ten years. However, I'm sure that Lord will be able to talk to us. In 1970, directors in the UK had to take care of their environment. If you look at Germany, on the boards, 50% of the board members are employees. And even in countries like France and Italy or Spain, it is difficult for a board or CEO to make decisions if you don't care uh, with, the, with the employees because the union wouldn't go on strike. So somewhere, somehow, stakeholder capitalism has existed in some kind, shape, or form. So here we see three very different models. Not one is better than the others, because each of them depends on the culture and the way people want to be managed. At IFA, we believe that there's a European way to uh, governance, and we are working very hard to define it, to create it, and to uh, lobby for it. So how does this apply for, um, for specific uh, action, for example? We talked about diversity of boards. 
Diversity of boards, we have to look at, you know, the French system was very, very backward about 11 years ago. Thanks to the Loi uh, copesi birman which imposed to have a balance in gender, then today a French board have 45% of the, of the board members that are women. Not only we got diversity on gender, but we also got diversity on skills and competencies. And that has helped your uh, French board move towards, we believe, better boards. That decision which was tested here was taken in another country, Italy came the year later. And right now Emmanuel Macron has called to have this kind of diversity in all European boards. So what we can see is something that started in one country has been taken around and moved forward. And I should, I'll take another example. Again, in, in Germany, 50% of the, uh, the not supervisory board members are employees. France decided to have one, then two people on the boards that represent the employees because France wanted to have more diversity. Because we believe that diversity helps make a better decision. In August 2000, the NASDAQ decided to ask all its companies, this and does that, to have diversity as well within their boards. And it didn't define as employee, it defined as you know, people representing minorities, LGBTQ, and minimum of women. So we can see here that uh, actions that were taken from Europe were able to spearhead around the world. And so we kept true to our values and what we define, and we can have impact on the world. And we can talk about our GPD as well and other laws. So this is what we do at IFA. We believe that there is a European law, a, a European governance, and it is us to stand for what we believe and either manage our European companies with this or what we believe is have impact as well on other elements. Even in the relationship between CEO <coughs> and the board of directors, correct? Absolutely. And here's, as you rightly, uh, as, um, as um, Serge rightly said, you know, that relationship has evolved as more and more demand has been given to board members, or more responsibility as well. So we see, you know, th there are new, way, there are new elements that board members have to take care of and or the CEO, whether it's new social expectations, whether it's environmental issues, as we talked, whether it's a change in balance between professional and personal lives, whether it's you know, uh, how states are going back to a state country model, uh, which, which will lead to separation of contents and war, whether the mer merge of social media, whether scientific and technological disruption, whether it's uh, you know, new social democratic uh, issues. All those is happening in the world. Somewhere, somehow, the board has to make a call on this. The CEO has to come with option, and discussion needs to happen. If there is no discussion, the board is not functioning. And, e and what we know as well, what we've experienced, is that it's not because you always have a good governance that you always have a good company. However, if you don't have a good governance, you're always going to have poor results. So up to us to work on, 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 on those issues and to ensure that the CEO and the board have the humility to you know, question themselves and, and realize that, you know, like we say, uh, four eyes are better than two. And with the board, with uh, eight people, you may have 16 eyes. 16 eyes plus the CEO, that's 18 eyes, are better than two. Thank you very much, Denis. Uh, Angeles Garcia Pareva, you have more than three decades of experience in board search. You are the first, or maybe the second, independent chairwoman of the CAC 40. Uh, could you tell us a bit more about corporate citizenship and working with the stakeholders? And does, it, in practice, does it work working with the stakeholders even for a managed transactions, for instance? Mm. It should. I think. In, indeed, um, corporate citizenship and uh, the imperative to combine at the same time financial performance with extra financial impact has become, beyond fashions, has become an absolute must-have and actually one and the other work hand in hand and sometimes reinforce each other. Hopefully they, they do most of the time. Um, it is one 
one of the challenges that boards face, but uh, we've listed many others, and that's what make, makes it complex. Because if we only had to incorporate that in, I would say, a quote-unquote normal environment, that would be sort of easy. The difficulty is, and uh, Serge and Denis have listed some of those, we do that in a very specific macroeconomic and geopolitical environment at a point in time where all the spotlights are shed on governance, and actually the, you know, the, the, the entire world is looking at boards and asking boards for accountability and asking boards for, um, to justify what they do and why they do it. And that's what makes it complex, because you, you need to maximize so many variables in, in one equation. It is not rare that a board has to wave a storm. I mean, it's proper of boards, otherwise we wouldn't need them, right? What is new is that we have this concomitancy of storms in all different fields. Um, those the need to be much more connected, those the need to be much more diverse, because we need these different pairs of eyes and we also need um, to stand together. In, this, in these moments that require more courage, uh, more independence, and asking the difficult question that uh, there was a point in time where nobody needed to ask, because frankly, things were sort of rolling, right? So how do we manage corporate citizenship in that context? I think um, you can't make it a sort of module. You can't make it sort of a topic. Because if you do, then it becomes fake. Um, the way we try to treat it is by basically embedding that in everything we do. It's as simple as that. And that's, that's one of the reasons why when we first got the ESG roadmap into the room, we intentionally added it to the strategic committee because it was the committee that was basically taking care of the budget, taking care of big M&A transactions, taking care of major investments. Therefore, it was a place where we decided how to spend the money. That was the, the, the place to speak about those topics because it, it, it was the right level of discussion, it was the right level of trade-off, and it was a place where it wasn't just about ticking boxes. To involve the stakeholders' voices wasn't very difficult because they already were in the room. At Le Grand, there's a long, long story of dialogue with uh, laborers, with trade unions. Even before the Loi Pact in France, there were four representatives in the room attending all board meetings. It wasn't always easy, as you can imagine. Um, but then when we were forced by the law and the regulation and the market practice to implement um, the uh, labor representatives, it was already done. It was part of the normal life of the board. We didn't really notice any big change, right? It was, it was just part of it. Um, that's for labor, but we also have, of course, investors. We have proxies. We have consumers. We have um, employees, we have the broader um, world, the broader um, sort of uh, testimony of, of, us, of society. And what we try to do is get those voices into the conversation. Um, and let me give you an example. There was um, a point in time last year where we knew we had to make very important decisions uh, reviewing our climate change objectives. We wanted to raise the bar in terms of carbon impact. We wanted to embark the board in what was going to be a very demanding journey because um, ESG is not new at Le Grand. We've been there uh, since 2007. We are publishing our fifth roadmap. So, of course, every roadmap you publish is more and more difficult to attain, right? So there was a lot of effort that would be required to get everybody on board. And we knew we needed to spend time getting deeper knowledge from a technical perspective, but also more conviction, uh, more genuine commitment, uh, more engagement, simply. And what we did was to basically bring those external voices into the board. 
Um, and I think in that respect, we need to be somehow thankful for a year and a half of COVID imposed digital meetings because we suddenly realized we could actually open the doors and the windows of the board to external knowledge. So we invited on board scientists, we invited on board uh, regulators, we invited on board investors, we invited... Well, board member, correct? No, 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 just to just speak to, to us, just to speak to us, just to connect, just to have a direct dialogue with people who mattered in the decisions we were about to make. Guess what's happened? Magic. We got out of the room, not only being more informed, but also having listened directly to those who mattered for that specific decision. And I think this was, you know, it was a sort of experiment we did. <laughs> we, we liked it, so we, we started again this year on te technology topics, which is another area where we want to progress. But I believe it's a new dynamic that boards need to start having. Um, and I think Serge was referring to that earlier. We cannot possibly pretend to be effective in what we do as board members in only five, six meetings a year with that point of contact and maybe a couple of days of prep. It's just not possible. We need to be much more nourished. We need to be much more connected, much more in contact. And we'll speak about that later. M&A, to answer your question, and sorry for a long answer, David. M&A is um, a very important part of our growth. Uh, mostly half of it comes from external growth. It's bolt-on acquisitions rather than uh, big, you know, um, <coughs> structuring acquisitions. Uh, therefore, very, very important to look at these topics, not only because we want to make sure that the companies we target are in line with our objectives, and our objectives are not only financial, again, but also because we can actually be a platform for those people to get on the train of transformation. So we look at it, but we don't look at it in the sense of saying, do they comply or not comply if they don't comply, goodbye. What we look at is, where are they? What is their genuine intention to change, and can we help them do it? And we do that for M&A, but we also do that for suppliers, who are most of the time also mid-sized companies. And that's the power of the ecosystem. And I think when you, you have a chance to be riding a powerful horse, you need to get that platform to try to get all the people on board. And that's how we maybe have a chance to attain our objectives as a society, which are very big and very challenging. But we, we, we should not underestimate um, the power the boards can have and the, the, the role they can play. Because we are presenting all these topics as challenges. I'd like to think about them as opportunities, actually. Thank you very much. Now we're going to change the subject to different stakeholders. So, David Gould, uh, you are a member of the House of Lords, a partner in a law firm, and you are, we may like it or not, lawyer. And I am saying this as a professor of law. Uh, you have worked on FCPA, UK bribery, act issues, etc. So when you work in a global firms that have supply chain in, uh, in the global marketplace, uh, the question is how you deal with these regulatory issues let's say, compliance and corruption or anti-bribery. Could you tell us a bit more about how you operate and what kind of advices you provide? Well, thank you very much, David. Um, I very much enjoyed the contribution of all our speakers so far. But I have to say, I've been asking myself why anyone would ever be a director of a company. <laughs> especially listening to Serge's comments on the comparison of compensation, US companies and <laughs> French companies. I, I can give you one little bit of heart for all of you who may be considering being directors of French companies or indeed are directors. All that you've heard that is terrible with the economic situation, the pandemic, multi-level inflation, etc. 
just take this home with you. It's far worse in the UK. We've also got Brexit. <laughs> um, the responsibility on directors is phenomenal. We've heard that through some of the examples that have been given. So how on earth do boards of directors stay on top? It's very important that the partnership that Serge mentioned between the management team and the board is a very close one and it works together. It works well. But when it comes to governance and compliance, the essential thing is that the tone from the top in the company, the message from the very top, is uncompromising in terms of good behaviours right through the organization. And it's not just words that matter, it's also living and breathing that message so that by the example given, certainly by the CEO, but also all board members, what the workforce see is that management truly believes in what it is saying. And the risks for companies are phenomenal. I've spent the last 11 years advising or monitoring companies, multi-international companies. Three of them have been in the defense business. So it's BAE Systems, Rolls-Royce, who make the aircraft engines, and most recently, Airbus, a company very dear to my heart, and I'm sure to many of yours as well. And they have had to change. They found themselves in major problems, All, almost, in each case, those problems have arisen by something that has happened far away from head office, often in the Middle East, uh, sorry, in the Far East. And it has mostly involved agents, intermediaries, advisors, and the center at head office has said, go out and make business for us. We don't know, we don't want to know how you do it. And for English companies, the introduction of the Bribery Act 2010 and Section 7 there, which I will mention, I'll explain to you in a moment, has been a phenomenal impetus on directors doing the right thing. Section 7 requires companies in the UK to show that they have in place a system that will avoid corruption. And that is very significant indeed. So instead of allowing the man in the Far East to go off and do what he likes with a brown envelope with lots of money in it, they have to demonstrate that actually there is process in place that will prevent that happening. And this, is, this has been a very significant development in UK companies. But for boards, the responsibility stops there. As I used an expression in the workshop earlier, the board has to hold management's feet to the fire. They have to challenge, they have to make sure that the way in which the company is operating is compliant. And it has to be done, lots of things are needed. You have to have proper communication, proper training, and by training, I don't just mean a wild, um, wild lessons on everything under the sun. Focused training, meaning something to the people being trained, so that they actually understand what it means in the job that they are doing. And you also need a very strong disciplinary process in place, so that if things go wrong, the, those who are in the wrong are disciplined. You need a speak-up line. You need to encourage people to come forward with issues, and they need to feel safe that if they raise an issue, they won't be dismissed. It's a whole combination of all of these things. But to bring it back to the board, the training for the board is important too. You've heard from Serge um, and others how much a board is responsible for, all the things they have to look at. So they need to be focused. And in making sure that the board is helped in asking the right questions is an absolute, absolutely essential feature. 
The risks that every company has today are very great indeed. Who would ever have thought of the consequences that are coming out of the Ukraine war? It's an incredible thing. Boards have to think ahead of this. So working closely with management is key. And using one's intelligence is terribly important. I want to end, I'll ask, answer questions if you want to admit, but I'll end on one very simple point, which may hit a note with you, those of you who work in companies. The starting point is for companies to have rules and regulations. When I took up the monitorship of BAE systems, I thought that the first thing I should do would be to read the rules. Well, I went into a room and the rules started on the floor and they went as high as the ceiling. No one can be expected to know that, to understand all that. So focused training using focused rules that actually point you in the right direction and make you ask the right questions are absolutely key. So I hope I've covered your, your question. Yeah, thank you very much. Another stakeholder, the planet, the environment, how both should address this question? Monica, you work extensively in this space, this specific field. Yeah, uh, hello everyone. Um, thank you for having me. Um, my point is uh, uh, a climate change. And uh, climate change is the factor that shakes the business and also the way we do governance or traditional governance. And this for two reasons, two main reasons. The first one is uh, climate change is systemic and climate change comes with a uh, radical uncertainty. The systemic point uh, is uh, simply explained. Uh, so a company cannot solve climate change alone, right? Uh, and if a company acts well and the other company act well as well, now we are safe and uh, we all win. But if a company acts well and the other company do not, the company then loses more than the other. And this is a fundamental uh, disincentive for board to act and for company to act. So you really need to have a, a very bold, visionary and uh, courageous leader uh, to take the stance regardless of the risk. <coughs> Second characteristic is a, a, a um, radical uncertainty. And this is uh, on the regulation and this is on technology. We don't know how regulation, how fast regulation will be deployed, how wide it will be. We don't know how technology will disrupt our business. On regulation, uh, Serge mentioned scope three. Scope three emission are the ones that we, that we don't control directly. Uh, for example, are the ones coming out from our, the use of our products or of our services. So we know, all know that uh, reporting on scope 3 is very tricky, the data are poor and the mass doesn't work. Is this a good reason for not to report? What's happening today at the level of the SEC, for example, the SEC is, the, there is very much on the table, on the climate disclosure, a safe arbor for scope 3 disclosure. So this is a very pragmatic uh, option uh, in order to move on, regardless of the fact that regulation is not, uh, is not in place and, uh, and data quality is not there. And then technology. We are, it is statistically proven the company who invest highly in R&D, they behave, they perform better than the one who do not. Now, it's not because you invest in R&D that, uh, that you, your, your projects are successful. It can be that another company comes with a better solution earlier, more cost effective. But still, all these um, acting without the certitude that uh, we are going to hit, we are going to succeed, these are the dilemmas that, uh, that climate change is posing us. So being so unique, being so systemic, being so a risk of a failure of the entire ecosystem, this, for this, we don't need a cozy, uh, don't rock the boat type of dialogue. We need a very uh, open, a very healthy debate to address this type of uh, dilemmas. Thank you very much. Uh, Monica, what we're going to do is we're going to switch to the second question. We are running late. 
And then the question to all of you, the four of you, it's basically how you implement that at a board level in the composition, selection, training, onboarding of board members. Um, working to start with you, Angeles, if you accept. Uh, in yep. terms of, uh, I mean, you have developed, or you, yep. or maybe not. Serge. You okay with that? Yeah. Angeles, oh, no, no, uh, Serge. So in terms of composition of the board, do you have a strategy? Uh, <coughs> fortunately, yes. Uh, we, we, uh, first, we are obliged to report annually on the set of competencies that you have in the board. So you have a sort of uh, um, general uh, framework where you, you have to de detect or select why are those board members there? What do they bring to the table? And this is a process that is being followed also on the annual evalu evaluation of the board, because we do a 36 degree, 360 degrees uh, review of the, con of the contribution of all board members, individual board members, to the board. So the board members are not only appreciated or evaluated by the nomination committee, but also by all the board members. And uh, recently, we had a case of a board member which was, which was considered as non-effective. And uh, we had to ask uh, that person to uh, stop being a board member because er, the contribution was not considered enough. Afterwards, you have uh, to balance the composition in comparison with what you expect. Where is the direction? where you want to go. For instance, we have a major digital challenge. Health, basically, is not a very highly penetrated area for digital. So we had, and that was very interesting, we had to lead the way to the, to the uh, XCOM of the company to say, well, six, no, eight years ago, no one heard about digital within the company. And the, 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 the board started to raise the question, what are you doing in digital? And the, the answer was, wh wh why do you ask the question? So as a board, we decided to go to California. We set a meeting there with all the XCOM members, all the board members. We spent three days looking at startups, going to Google, uh, opening our eyes. And that was uh, what... Uh, Angeles was saying, well, we, uh, we need to open our eyes and we need to understand what is missing. What is the direction we need to give to the company? It's not a passive situation where you just need to accompany the company. You have to set the tone, not only in terms of behaviors, which is very important, and I'm talking about uh, ethics. Uh, by the way, we have, since December 16, we have the same type of law in France than the uh, UK Bribery Act. Uh, and we have almost the same set of regulation today. So ethics is very important. Uh, no compromise on this. This has to be very clear from the top to the bottom. But what is more demanding to a certain extent is what are the pieces of the jigsaw that we are missing to get where we want to go? Uh, Pharmacy is a rather complex business. Science is, of course, the base of it, but it's not enough. We have to be uh, as efficient as possible, and traditional science is not working enough, hasn't got the productivity that digital could create. So that was typically an, an area where we needed to have within the board someone who was uh, critical and credible from that standpoint. So that's why we recruited at that time Bernard Charles, who was the CEO of Dassault System, because at any board meeting, he was talking about the subject again and again, and, and challenging the board and, and the, the, the management team saying, where are you now on this? What are you doing? So of course, there was a sort of uh, conflict of interest to a certain extent, because he was providing services. So at the end, we had to uh, explain to him that it was better to be out of the group 
rather uh, the team uh, rather than in because that was limit that would limit his business. So, uh, but uh, now it's it's in. So we don't ha need to make the same effort. We have the the team working on this. But that's you need to have a vision about where the company needs to go, and then you compose the the, the board with that in mind. And you have, uh, as I mentioned, diversity. Uh, I, the only thing I regret today is that we have gender diversity, we have technical diversity, competence diversity. We don't, know, we don't have uh, diversity in terms of races. Uh, I'm not saying that to comply to the uh, uh, general wisdom about uh, total diversity. I'm not uh, a fan of classification. But I think that it's good for a company that has so many employees. We have 110,000 employees in the world. Most of them are non-European. It's good to give them the impression, or not just the impression, because that's too much communication, but the feeling that anyone in this company can have the chance to make it to the top. And uh, we need to be a little bit less, although we are French, and we assert that we are French. Uh, and, and no, because you have a lot of CEOs today in France that are very happy to say, well, I'm French, but, you know, I'm, I'm more Anglo-Saxon than you, what you think. Because I'm, I'm worried about the stock price, like you. I'm obsessed by the stock price. So the US investors, you're very good, I, I understand you. So don't, don't miss the, the portrait, I, I am on your side. That's not my case. And I, I, I believe this is a terrible thing for the French companies. We have our set of talents, skills. We have many skills. If you look at the, the number of big companies in France compared to the size of the, of the share of France in, in, the, in the global net growth product, we have a, an immense amount of very good, very strong companies because of culture, largely. Because we are open to different cultures more than some others. More than the Germans, by example. By, 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 you know, if I make a comparison. But, you know, this is something that sometimes we are not proud about. We tend to figure out that it's better not to be French because we like to be global, you know. One time I was in a board and the question mark was about uh, you know, CEO decided to leave France and to work in another place. And uh, I say, I'll have my management team everywhere in the in the in in the world. And I said, he said, uh, well, we are a global company. We are not specifically French. He's very French. But uh, I said, well, but you 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 think you you're not French? You know, we are global. I say, I said to him, you know, if by any unfortunate situation, you are going to be under attack of one of your most important competitor, who by then was German. You will go and see the global finance minister to ask him to help you. And uh, he felt so strong that uh, he didn't care about it. But uh, this is a risk. We, we need to be tranquil about the fact that we are what we are, but we are global. You know, we have most of our board members are international. But that's okay, no problem. Our ex-com members are mostly international. But we're French, that's okay. What is your vision? French, global, <laughs> European? <laughs> as, a, as one of the non-French members of this panel, <laughs> who feels very French, by the way. Um, David as well. That's a Indeed. Is this, is this working? Yeah? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, so, so how to, you know, what's the answer that boards could give to all these different challenges slash opportunities that we've uh, spoken about this evening? Um, composition is definitely one. I think um, we, we won't, um, I won't spend more time on it. I, I would just maybe add one thing, which is on types of experience. Um, I do think a mix of people who have actually been in the CEO seat or are in the CEO seat and others who bring those you know, deep technical knowledge on specific matters is really healthy. 
just because some of the challenges we spoke about are so transversal that actually it's not so much about the sector, it's more about having been the captain on the boat and, and being under that same kind of pressure. And that's what we observe, I think, in our boardroom is that um, for, for Benoit, our CEO, is incredibly helpful to sometimes be able to compare notes with other CEOs who are basically going through the same. So I would just add that and it, it, it's another dimension and, and diversity is definitely multi-dimensional um, and we need to start complete all the time thinking about what is the next dimension of diversity that we haven't yet seen. Generations could be one, by the way. I don't know to which extent it is. It, it, we are ready today to get into that, but it, it might be the next frontier. Um, the, the other things that I see uh, could help are more about um, either the way the board is managed, either director's attitude. Um, and I, I think there's probably four additional attributes that I would um, see in a you know, modern board or, or, or performing board. One, one is, um, uh, as I said, to be a learning board. Uh, and we spoke about that earlier. I think we, we have, any director has the duty um, and the opportunity to continue learning all the time and it needs to be facilitated by the chair by the management and and actually learning together is like traveling together it does create bonds so it has many other benefits that you don't see at first sight uh, the second thing i would say is connect a connected board and digital is there to stay and it is also in the boardroom is a fantastic opportunity to share information manage information follow uh the news on the companies where we sit and other on, also on the competitors, because I argue as a director, you need to know as well the competition of the company where you're sitting on the board than the board itself. You absolutely need to have your own views on competition and not only get what is given to you in the boardroom, you, you need to be independent in that, in that way. Um, so, so being connected and being in a flow of information, in a continuous <coughs> relationship as opposed to a sort of spot on dropping uh, relationship throughout the year is key. Uh, so learning connected. Uh, I, would, I would add engaged um, as a very uh, important personal characteristic. Make it personal. Being a director is a personal matter. It's about who you are, your values, your ability to stand for what you believe in. Um, is the uh, opportunity to actually have an impact on what happens in, in a company and in a broader society. So it's a great uh, position to be in, but it's also an obligation, and it's a personal obligation. Um, and then the last one would be forward-looking. I think it is, a board is, is a constant balance between support and challenge and between backward-looking and forward-looking, and you absolutely need to keep those four pieces of the matrix in place but probably in contexts like the one we are living, the forward-looking piece becomes more and more important because we simply don't know what we don't know. So it's about helping management be successful by avoiding isolation and also looking at the things that he or she might not see yet. Thank you very much. And regarding <coughs> regulation, I mean, compliance, let's say, what are the kind of advice that you provide to board, even in terms of communication? Um, I think that I mentioned earlier that it's very important that the board has training as well. And I think that um, the board will be told the basics of compliance, but hopefully they will have that through the wide experience that I would hope they bring to the company. I thought that both of you really said it all in terms of what the director needs are. I would like to make one additional comment, if I may. Um, each company will determine, according to its business, its geographical reach, etc., what they need the board to cover and they will need to cover the whole dimension. Diversity is very important indeed. I hope this isn't controversial. However, 
It is very important that diversity doesn't determine the choice. It's the skill that the individual brings to the company that is absolutely essential. If you just put together a board that looks the right shape or whatever, but doesn't have the talent, then I'm afraid they don't think you've achieved what you need for the company. And in selecting the members of the board, I think you want them to challenge each other. You don't want a healthy, nodding donkey attitude. Um, I want to end by just lightening things. In England, um, lawyers are not welcome on boards. Did you all know that? Very rare for lawyers to be on PLCs. Why? First of all, they talk too much, as I'm now demonstrating. <laughs> Secondly, they sit on the fence. And third, they always say no. <laughs> so, Monica, would you say yes to the planet? And what kind of training? <laughs> yeah. My, my, on, on the theme I, I, I mentioned before, I would say three, three points being uh, climate change educated, um, open to think differently, the contrary of the French word uh, psychorigide. And uh, what is the most important to me is being solution oriented. And uh, in, the, in, the, in the transition that we are facing, in the climate change transition, there is not a single technology that has to be excluded from the solution. The, the Repower EU uh, uh, plan that, uh, that Europe published uh, the 18th of, uh, of uh, May includes quite a lot of technology. So uh, I'm, I'm uh, upset at people being against nuclear, against carbon capture and storage. So uh, nuclear, I think France is very lucky to have nuclear. Uh, and. Um, and it's a better, it's a better, a, a possible risk today that a certain failure tomorrow. Same for CCS, carbon capture and storage. This is a transition solution that is required for hard to abate sectors. And uh, it, is not, it is seen from some uh, militant as uh, the way to continue to pollute for oil and gas. So my point is uh, we need to be solution oriented, educated. Education means uh, I defend uh, the association that we created with some other directs or Chapter Zero France. It's a platform to learn. So the whole board needs to be educated. And the, uh, the, the tool that ECP developed, so Drew and David, uh, you developed uh, three years ago, the board simulation with our dream team, the dream waiver was also a fantastic uh, tool uh, to share and to, yeah, to, to, to make uh, a real cases uh, out of uh, a possible option, a possible dilemma that, uh, that comes to the board table. So I encourage you to, to use that. I think for students, for us, uh, to be facing uh, uh, dilemmas is a fantastic tool. Thank you very much. I don't think we have the time for Q&A, so we're going to, if it's okay with you, we're going to conclude because we have a magnificent cocktail. <laughs> so, Drew, you have the floor for the last part. So now you're standing between us and a magnificent cocktail. <laughs> That's a really hard act to follow. Um, so I think that this... Well, first, let me thank... Uh, thank you for sharing what you've just shared with us. It's an incredible collection of insights that we're lucky to have benefited from. And I wanted also to thank everybody who's taken time from their busy day to, to share this with us. And I also would like to tell you a little bit about the work of the KPMG Professorship in International Corporate Governance. What we've just experienced in this conference and uh, what was experienced in the workshops that preceded it, a couple of them today and one of them yesterday. These are examples of the kinds of conferences, the kinds of workshops that the professorship has been putting together and presenting for the last several years. And there's also been publication of articles and a variety of media to share the knowledge that we've been compiling, the knowledge we've been producing.